Okay, go ahead, first, uh, chapter 12. <coughs> the Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the people and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, when did he receive that promise? That was back here, okay? But people think, because it's not in order, they think that he got this when he's in Haran. And then he goes down to Canaan. This is the land of Israel now. Anyway, he goes down here from Haran. I don't know where Haran is. It's somewhere around here, and I didn't know it, but it's probably in a, a map in the back of your Bible. But anyway, he didn't receive that here. He received that back here. They stopped here. The father maybe was tired. You know, i got to stop. You know, let's name it after your son and stay here until I die. Whatever. But anyway, he receives that back here. Then it says... Um, now the Lord had said to Abraham, thank goodness it says that, but most people just equate the calling with him being in Haran. Uh, from your father's house to a land that I will show you, I will make you. Now this is an unconditional promise. It doesn't give any conditions on it. It just simply says that I will give you this land, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Okay, that is all there is to it. If we curse the chosen line of Abraham, the people that he chooses, and he specifically says, like um, uh, uh, speaking of Ishmael a little bit later, Ishmael's born, he says, oh, but you would bless uh, Ishmael too. And he said, no, um, actually, he says, yeah, I'll bless him, but your seed shall be reckoned through Isaac. Okay, and the same thing happens again and again down through the generations is that God has sovereignly chosen the second over the first. And he does this all the way down through there saying this is the seed of promise. That is the line that is, receives this blessing. Okay, it is not all of the other people. It is the chosen line. Those you bless, I will bless. Those you curse, I will curse. We can go to Numbers real quickly just so we can see this. Um, numbers... And this is repeated elsewhere in the Old Testament, but in Numbers 31, it says here, um, uh, take, nope, not 31, we want to go back a little bit more. We want to go to where Balaam is told to, Balaam or whatever his name is, he's told to um, uh, take up his oracle. And it says here in uh, uh, verse, let's see, it's got to be in chapter 24 somewhere maybe. 22. 22 also. Um, is it 22? Okay. It's uh, 24 verse 9. Okay. 24 verse 9. Um, yes. Blessed is he who blesses you and cursed is he who curses you. Now earlier he says, you know, I can only bless who the Lord tells me to bless and who to curse whom the Lord tells me to curse. But he actually does it in verse 24. He's preaching an oracle over the people of Israel and he says, blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Well, that just confirms what I just said, that this is not an unconditional covenant to all the descendants of Abraham. It's an unconditional descent covenant to the descendants whom God chooses. Okay? Anyway, um, so that's just a little side, side note of that. But um, where were we? Go ahead. Verse 4. 12-4. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was... 75 years old when he set out from here. Okay, so he was 75 years old when he left from here. Okay? He wasn't 75 years old when he left from here. Okay? Now, if you add all this up, and I know that I got stuff all over the place, this will prove that he was younger than his brother Haran. Okay? Or, yeah, who died here. All right, so he is the second son. I've got the study. If you want it, I can give it to you because, like I said, we could spend all day on this, this little thing. But all this is doing is, is it's showing the doctrine of divine election. God is choosing the second over the first for his sovereign purposes because the firstborn always gets all the blessings. Even God says to do this, you know, give him a double portion of this, and, and etc. But God sovereignly chooses the second, it's same thing with uh, Judah's two children. Uh, we talked about this last week, I think, where the, the child put out its arm, they put the scarlet thread on it, pulled its arm back in. That's technically the firstborn, and the other one comes out first, okay? And that is the son in G Jesus' genealogy. And this is, there's, there's countless 
examples of this in the Old Testament. And not just people, but places, but positions of authority, etc. Anyway, um, go ahead. 75 years old, five. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Okay, so just so you know, Abraham's name is really Abram, and Sarah's name is really Sarai at this time. It's later that God changes their names. He picks the names for them, okay? But that's just so you know, because it's confusing. You see Sarai and Abram, it's, their names were changed, and that's coming up pretty soon. Anyway, then it says they, um, let me see here, five... Uh, real quickly here, um, uh, Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had, uh, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. So they had become wealthy in the land of Haran. They'd acquired slaves, they'd acquired all kinds of flocks and stuff. Does that uh, resemble anybody else that was in basically the same area? Who else did the same thing in exactly the same place? Jacob. He went up there and he uh, ended up coming back with two wives and two concubines, or basically four wives, a whole bunch of children, and all of Laban's flocks and everything else. All right? God's blessing is upon these people. Anyway, that comes later, but it's in the same place. Um, or, yeah, okay, anyway, go ahead. Um, Abraham left them, took all of his stuff, and then wherever he were, six, I think. Through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. Okay. To your offspring. Now, there are a lot of offspring of Abraham to this day in the Middle East. They're all over the place. The Muslims are also sons of Abraham. But they are not the ones that are entitled to the land. Again, this is a land covenant with the promised seed of Abraham. It is not a land covenant with the sons of Edom or the sons of Moab or the sons of Ishmael. This is a land covenant with the people of Israel. And that is unconditional. It's their land and nobody else's. But it is conditional for the people to dwell in the land. And we'll get to that eventually. When they disobey, out they go, as I made that, that the, right here. Disobedience means exile, but God has promised a land to them. And that's evidenced by the fact that they were gone for 2,000 years, and for 2,000 years, nobody wanted that land. There were a few people living in there. The land was waste. It was completely devoid of any trees or of any life. It had one rain instead of two, which it always had two rains in the past. All of a sudden, there's one rain. And uh, have I talked about this before, the land of Israel? And I have. Okay. Really, really interesting how the land needs the Jewish people. And without them, the land will not be productive. But as soon as they came back in, wow. So those of you who missed that, I apologize because it's a pretty cool study on the land of Israel and the Jewish people returning. But now they do have two reigns in the land of Israel, again, the former, former and latter reigns. And that goes to um, the book of James, I believe one of the few New Testament prophecies outside of the book of Revelation where he says, see how the farmer waits uh, patiently for his crops, for the former and latter rains, so you should wait, the Lord's coming is near. I believe that when we see two rains in the land of Israel, it is a prophecy that Jesus' coming is near. And we now have two rains in the land of Israel because they've gone in, they've replanted all of these trees. Mom and I have stood next to some they planted way back in the 1800s, right when Zionism was starting. Giant eucalyptus trees. But, you know, that's what they did. Is they, they went to Australia, brought up these eucalyptus trees to drain all the swamps. And uh, uh, so some of those original trees that the original Zionists planted are still there. But they're I don't know if it's still the case, but when we were there five or six years ago, it was the only nation on earth that year after year has a net gain of trees because they just plant trees all the time. People go there and they plant trees. You know, you can buy, you go on a tour there and they say, would you like to plant a tree in your name or somebody else's name? And they're all over. So anyway, the land now has again two rains the way that God promised. But that's, we won't get into any more of that, but there's a lot more about the land of Israel and the Jewish people moving back in. So are you leaving? So oh. Wow, you are in so much trouble. Okay, um, she's done this four weeks in a row now. Um, you must have a boyfriend or something. What's going on? <laughs> she's trying to develop this responsibility to me. Yeah, oh boy. Well, you've been taken off every week on us, and uh, I don't know. Some of the people actually start crying when you leave. They're like, well, where's your mom going, son? Uh, 
All right. Okay, so I don't know where we were. We did, um, oh, verse uh, 7 we read. Verse 8. Anyway, 12, 8. Go ahead. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Okay, now all of these names in here will come up again as the people are in the land. I is, uh, they went in and they destroyed Jericho, right? And they were disobedient. One of the people, Achan, the son of Carmi, was disobedient. He kept some of the booty. They went to attack this teeny little city of Ai, and they couldn't overcome it. Right? So that will come up in Joshua 7, I believe. No, Joshua. Yeah, Joshua 7. I may be wrong. 6, 7. Anyway, um, so, but these same names will start coming up. Bethel. Okay? Does anybody know what the name Bethel means? I've taught you a little bit. No, that's Bethlehem. <laughs> Beth? Beth means house. Okay? L means God, the house of God, okay? Now, I have seen people claim, and I, I'm not sure I entirely believe this, but they have these satellite photos of, of over Israel and the divine name yod He vav He, the, you know, the, the name of Jehovah, is actually written into the hillside. I saw this on one of these Christian sites, and I think people are stretching it there. I don't think God actually etched his name in Bethel, but somebody made that claim, and you can go online and you can look at the picture. But anyway, and I'm sure it's, well, I won't say I'm sure it is, but I think people like to make things happen, you know, computer-generated stuff. But anyway, um, uh, there is something kind of interesting, though. Having said that, I will tell you that the way that Israel, I, I'm sorry, Jerusalem is laid out, it actually does appear to make a shin, which is uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, shin tav, it would be the 20 first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, it, uh, you know, like um, uh, Shem means name, okay, uh, Hashem, the name, instead of saying God, they'll say Hashem, anyway, it does look like a shin right over Jerusalem, and it kind of points to the character of God and all that, but anyway, whether the divine name is actually written over Bethel or not, I think is probably questionable, but just so you know, you can go online, and you can look at that if you want. Um, just type in, okay, love you, have a nice day. Um, okay, moved on from Bethel to Ai, he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Okay, verse 9. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Negev. Okay, now, just so you know, some translations will say the south, because south means Negev, or Negev means south, but it is also a place, the Negev Desert, okay? So people will translate this depending on how they want you to interpret it. He's heading towards the south, or he's heading towards the Negev, meaning the Negev Desert. Okay, um, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say, you are my sister, so I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Okay, so is he doing the wrong thing or not by saying that? Because you're going to hear sermons, both, you know, people saying, oh, what Abraham was... Now, it, it may have lacked faith in God's covenant. <sighs> okay, he may have lacked a little bit of faith because God promised that he's going to have a son. He's going to, you know, uh, give him all these descendants and everything. But um, maybe he hadn't done that yet. Hang on. I will make you into a great nation. So he did. Um, it may have lacked faith on that, but he didn't lie. Yeah. She is his sister. Yeah, she's a half-sister. So just so you know, I mean, it's not a lie. He's worried about his safety in the land of Egypt, and he says, you know, tell these people that you're my sister. Um, what transpired probably wasn't the wisest thing for Abraham to do, but, you know, go ahead and keep reading. <laughs> when Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was very, a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's offspring, or when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into the pal his palace. Okay, now this could have turned out bad, right? I mean, obviously, it could have. Uh, there's nothing to say that it did, but uh, as a matter of fact, I think it says just the opposite, and we're going to get there in a minute. But, you know, by doing what he did, it's like it, he's not fulfilling what we would call a New Testament husband who really is there to protect his wife at his own life, right? I mean, you know, it says um, husbands... Uh, something your wife, just as Christ, uh, died for the church. I, I, I miss, but anyway, love you love your wife. And, yeah, okay, well, how did he love, 
that's right. He was willing to die for her. Well, Abraham really wasn't willing to die for her. So <laughs> you, you see that? 